It is now my honor, my pleasure, to introduce this afternoon's commencement speaker. When I'm considering who to invite uh, to be our commencement speaker, I look for people who role model the leadership that we aspire to. People who have not only had successful individual careers, but who have had a unique impact on those they serve. The details of Marnie's career are in your program. So in introducing Marnie, I would simply like to highlight a few of the reasons that I invited her to be with us this afternoon. Marnie's career to date has spanned many different organizations and environments. Whether it was in government or business, the one constant is that Marnie has had a transformative and positive impact on how you and I, we live, how we work, how we interact with each other. Today, Marnie has global operations responsibility for Instagram, a social media platform that I expect many, if not all of our students are on right now. <laughs> she is one of the foremost thought leaders in the future of digital and social media. And on this milestone day for all of you, our students, Marnie's words of wisdom and her personal experiences will hopefully be both inspirational and meaningful to each and every one of you. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming a true leader who has made and continues to make a positive difference in the world through her leadership, Marnie Levine. Thank you for that kind introduction, Dean DeRue. Faculty, administrators, families, and friends, die-hard Wolverines. Those who will build the next billion-dollar company in their parents' garage. Those who will spend a year in their parents' basement not building the next billion-dollar company. And most importantly, to the Roth School of Business, great graduating class of 2018. Congratulations. I'm honored that you asked me to be your commencement speaker. And I'm humbled knowing that right now, many of you are probably sitting there right now thinking, was Coach Harbaugh too busy today? This is an intimidating assignment. You're graduating from one of the country's best business schools, which puts you ahead of half of Silicon Valley's biggest CEOs since you actually have a degree. <laughs> you excelled to get here, you excelled to graduate from here, and you are going to keep excelling. Today is a day of celebration, but it's also one of reflection so when I sat down to write this speech today, I wondered, what have I learned that I could share with you? What have I learned that um, you haven't already learned at the Ross School? And it hit me. There's a famous story about the ancient scholar Hillel. He lived around 110 BC, back before Instagram even existed. I think he mostly used MySpace. Hillel was in his 90s and very frail, and a smart aleck student of his came up to him and said, teacher, I challenge you to recite this Torah while standing on one foot. Hillel smiled. He said, no problem. Stood on one foot and spoke seven, 17 words. The essence of the Torah is love thy neighbor as you love yourself. The rest is commentary. So that's where I start. I'm not quite as old as Hillel, although some days I feel like it working at a company founded by millennials. FYI, when I was in middle school, my now boss was in diapers. Weird. I've worked in the Treasury Department at a university, slogged through business school, Worked at, worked at a startup at the dawn of the Great Recession, worked in the White House to help end said recession, 
spent four years at Facebook, and the last three as COO of Instagram, where we grew our community from around 100 million to one that is now nearly a billion today. I'm happily married with two amazing boys who teach me and my husband more than we could ever teach them. And through all of these adventures in government, business, and life, every lesson I have learned can be summed up in two words. You really could recite standing on one foot, maybe even tonight after you celebrate too much tonight at Good Time Charlie's or Skeep's. Two simple words, be kind. The rest is commentary. Now, there is an important reason to talk about this topic today. Because you are entering the world at a time where cruelty seems to be on the rise. Headlines in the news these days are filled with talk of dictators and dividers, bots and bullies, name calling and nastiness, which make for some pretty challenging conversations between me and my two boys at the dinner table. But I believe you can change that in your workplaces and in the world. The good news is research shows that companies and careers that are built on kindness are more successful by every definition. And kindness isn't just the right thing to do. It's a competitive advantage. Now, you may think I'm crazy. After all, we watch Shark Tank, not Kitten Tank. But I'm not talking about kittens and rainbows and touchy-feely kindness. So let me be clear about what kindness is and what kindness isn't. First, real kindness is saying something hard when it needs to be said in a nice way. It isn't about swallowing hard truths instead of speaking them. Adam Grant, a Wharton professor who also happens to be a Michigan grad, has studied different kinds of employees and focused on four qualities. Givers, takers, those who are agreeable or disagreeable. Okay, it's not hard to figure out that you don't want to be a taker. You want to be a giver. But you might assume that you always want to be agreeable. Sounds nice, right? Well, not always. Agreeable givers contribute a lot, but too often prioritize politeness over progress, so they might avoid talking tough, tough truths. It turns out that the most undervalued but important contributors to the, to the success of any organization are disagreeable givers, employees willing to say the hard things that must be heard. Kindness is also gender neutral. Outdated masculine definitions of leadership still linger, confident, tough, and aggressive. Traits traditionally viewed as feminine, kindness, inclusivity, sensitivity, aren't defined as leadership. But employees don't admire leadership that just commands and controls. They look up to leadership that nurtures. Last week, when the news was filled with the story of the Southwest Airlines pilot, who calmly, confidently, and safely landed a plane filled with 149 terrified passengers after engine failure, the stories rightly celebrated her skill, but they also foolishly dwelled on her gender. It wasn't male when she stayed calm. It wasn't female when she comforted the crew and passengers. We've got to stop saying that ambitious, decisive female leaders behave like men and empathetic, nurturing male leaders behave like women. Yeah. <laughs> Kindness isn't male or female. She was a great pilot, period. And we need to, we, and we need to value good leadership, full stop. Let me be clear, the kindness I am talking about most definitely isn't at odds with ambition. It isn't about downsizing your dreams or snuffing out your competitive fires. In fact, 
One raw student shared with me how some of your classmates come out of corporate recruiting interviews and slip helpful tips to the next candidate going in. You understand that life isn't a zero-sum game. The more your classmates succeed, the more you do too. So you see, the kindness I believe in has teeth. It's bold and driven. It speaks truth to power. It takes big risks on people and ideas. It's brutally honest and aggressively nice. It applies equally to all, regardless of identity. And it's a vital quality in any effective leader. But how do you put kindness at the center of your career? Well, on the last day of Ross, I thought it was only fitting to give you one more framework to think about and take with you. I coined this one myself, the three C's of kindness in the workplace, not to be confused with the five C's of marketing that you know and love so well. The three C's of kindness, kindness in the culture, kindness in your conduct, kindness when you're in charge. Let's start with kindness as culture. Don't just ask yourself where you want to work. Ask yourself, what kind of culture is important to you? Wherever you go, ensure it's a place that values kindness. Kindness should be pervasive from the leadership all the way down to the interns. My first private sector job was an awakening. I was working at a tech startup trying to revolutionize person-to-person -person money transfers. I was obsessed with this scintillating topic. I'd bring my work home with me, so much so that my husband had to beg me to shut up about it. Now, I was no stranger to pressure or long hours. I'd worked in the government where any mistake you'd made could be plastered all over the front page of the New York Times. But this was a different kind of pressure. I was on my own, my manager had no time for me, and wasn't exactly gentle in his feedback. The pressure to go to market was crippling, and there was little teamwork or collaboration. I stayed up all night writing and rewriting product roadmap documents alone. I worked in fear. And then, at the end of the year, we had our first performance cycle. And I got the call you dread. Could I please come down to HR for a meeting? It was the longest walk down the shortest hall because I knew I was about to be fired. But then, as I sat stiffly on this hard plastic chair, I heard the head of HR reading me the results of my review. I had gotten one of the top ratings, and I was honestly shocked to hear that they thought I was doing a good job. And while I was happy with my review, the more I thought about it, success isn't supposed to feel like failure. The daily pit in my stomach wasn't a reward for a job well done. I decided then and there that I never wanted to work in a place like that again. So I learned a big lesson. Culture counts. An organization should care not just about what you've accomplished, but how you've accomplished it. They should value the combination of impact and kindness. I look back on that time and I am reminded of exactly why the era of the brilliant jerk is ending. Netflix CEO Reed Hastings said in his famous company culture document, don't tolerate brilliant jerks. The cost to effective teamwork is too high. Companies that use kindness, not fear, as the building block of their culture, don't just bring out the best in you, they help you and your colleagues bring out the best in each other. Which brings me to the second C, kindness in your conduct. It's not just about picking a workplace with a culture you already admire. It's about adding to that culture from day one. And you can do that by being kind to everyone, not just the people in the C-suite. I learned this early and unexpectedly. I was 21 years old and I moved to Washington, D.C. And there was a job open at the U.S. Department of Treasury. This was pre-internet, so I actually had to look up in a heavy library textbook what the Treasury Department did. And by the way, 
a textbook is sort of like Wikipedia for the elderly. <laughs> I was called in to interview, and I sat for a while in the small anteroom waiting, just me and the executive assistant, Annabella Mejia, who I'm sure had seen countless other nervous job applicants like me sitting in that same exact chair. I filled in the time with some friendly chatter. I asked her where she was from, how long she had worked there, and whether she liked it. And then finally, this, this big brown door opened up and this tall, imposing figure walked out and escorted me into his office. After the interview wrapped, Annabella walked me out. I thanked her. She wished me luck. And guess what? I got the job. On my first day, Annabella walked up to me and she said, I'm glad you got the job. I told my boss I liked you the best. I was struck. I was struck because that she had influenced his decision and that maybe, just maybe, making a personal connection and treating Annabella with respect had helped me get the job. I'd meet plenty of people in Washington for whom anyone but their bosses or their peers were invisible. How many people like me had sat in that same exact chair not realizing that a very important person was sitting right beside them. You see, Annabella was an institution within an institution. The Treasury Secretary used to ask Annabella what she thought about candidates for jobs. What mattered to him, and what matters to me today when I am hiring people, is how a candidate acts out of plain view of the hiring manager. How you act towards the people you don't think you have to impress is a window into how they'll be on the job. Choosing between candidates of impeccable cr credentials, you'd be surprised how often the decision comes down to whether the person is kind. I reject candidates with great resumes who leave a bad taste with their future coworkers because in the long run, they're only gonna bring the team down. Businesses and organizations are flatter than they used to be, meaning collaboration is no longer optional. So remember, every relationship counts. Be kind for the sake of being kind and expect nothing in return. But don't be surprised when life has a funny way of rewarding it. Every time I hire someone good, I, ha I thank Annabella Mejia. And now you can too. And that brings me to the third C, kindness when you're in charge. It's the answer to the quintessential question every leader must ask, how do I bring out the best in others? My mentor, former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, didn't suffer fools. Mm -mm. But any time he heard someone was in trouble, a bad break, a bad breakup, a bad career turn. No matter what else was happening, Larry dropped what he was doing, picked up the phone, and reached out. He was often the first, and maybe sometimes the only one, who called and spoke the five words you were dying to hear. It's going to be okay. In business and in life, you will face ups and downs and highs and lows. You'll appreciate the people who share in the good times, you will, but you'll walk through fire for the people who were there for you when it was tough, and believe me, it's a much shorter list. Be one of the people on that list for your friends, for your colleagues, and for your family. Kindness works, but kindness is work. It's active, not passive. It's a muscle that can atrophy, and you have to keep your eyes open constantly for opportunities to be kind. When you are in charge, you set the tone, and small everyday actions can add up to big impact. For example, kindness is saying thank you, privately and publicly, and with meaning. Kindness is being on time for a meeting because you value everyone else's time. Don't be the reason someone doesn't get to tuck their kids in at night, or the reason someone misses their Tinder date. <laughs> Kindness is being self-aware. Words matter. When you send around edits to a document and announce you rewrote it, 
What everyone else hears is that their work didn't count. Maybe instead say you edited or revised. Kindness is saying little things that demonstrate that you see your coworkers as co-people. It's easier because of social media and the way it connects us, but it's up to you to verbalize it. Got engaged? We'll toast you. Going through a breakup? We'll bring the tissues and the ice cream. Jumped on stage at a rock concert? I will definitely ask you about that on Monday. It's 30 seconds to say something, anything, to break down the walls between everyday work and everyday life. Kindness is making eye contact as you rush down the halls, and kindness is knowing the names of the parking garage attendants, not just the people in the C-suite. If you practice this type of kindness in a way that is authentic to you, you won't just succeed as an individual. You'll re-energize your team. You'll reap the virtuous cycle of success that happens in a culture that brings out the best in you and brings out the best in others. You'll, cre you'll create something remarkable when you are invested together, and that is the real bottom line. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, I just spent a fortune on my education, and this lady is telling me that the most important lesson is something I learned in kindergarten? Hmm. Well, the truth is, we unlearn those lessons. Lessons like say thank you, take turns, don't hurt other people's feelings. Instead, we learn to be self-absorbed. We learn to make fun of those who are different and we learn to cut off other people's heads to make ourselves feel taller. We all remember that kid who was made fun of on the playground, and some would, great, some would go to great lengths to avoid being that kid. By some, I actually mean me. When I was four years old, I suffered a significant hearing loss. I should have gotten help, but I'd seen what those big clunky hearing aids look like, and I was terrified of being teased. So I learned to cope without them, to avoid someone saying something cruel. I mastered reading lips and always found the best seat in the front row of classrooms, slumber parties, and meetings so I could follow the conversation. Many years later, just a few years ago actually, I was introduced to these sleek, modern, high-tech, tiny, unobtrusive hearing aids. And it was as if someone had turned on the light switch in the darkness. I realized I had been walking around a company run by millennials, founded by millennials, sounding like a grandma, shouting, what? Can you please repeat that? What? What? All the time. And when I told one of my colleagues what I'd done, he was overjoyed for me and said with great, great affection, good, because you can't hear a freaking thing. But it made me think, I was confident enough to work in the White House to run a big company, and I was afraid for anyone to know that I couldn't hear? Why? It isn't that complicated. I was afraid of people being unkind. And that's why, when I joined Instagram, something really clicked for me. I personally connected with their mission because I saw what happens when people use our platform for kindness. We really believe that social media will create a kinder world where no one feels alone. Here's just one example. I came across this young woman, Aubrey Johansson, who lives in my hometown, Cleveland, and I was so moved by what she was doing. She came to Instagram because she felt it was a safe space where she could talk about her struggles with food, weight loss, and body positivity. She became a role model for a community of 132,000 followers. One of her followers wrote, you encourage me to keep going even if I think I can't. But we're not naive. We know that there are just as many Aubreys afraid to share their story because someone might attack them from the shadows. Just like how I was afraid someone would pick on me for my hearing loss. Individuals and groups find ways to abuse our platform, so post by post, comment by comment, we're working to create a home online 
where kindness is the rule and not the exception. We know we have to work at it constantly because when people are exposed to negativity on our platform, they leave. And we have a long way to go, but we are working to build a positive and supportive community every day. And every day as I do, I remember my younger self who should have worn hearing aids but was afraid that someone would say something mean. And that's a powerful connection to get me out of bed every morning. And it all comes back to the three C's of kindness. The culture that works for you, the way you conduct yourself with your colleagues, and the special responsibility that comes when you're in charge. And when all three C's are working together, there's actually a fourth C that emerges in a magical, catalytic kind of way. Kindness is contagious. I didn't invent kindness. I caught it like a virus from some of the amazing people who have taught me along the way. People like Larry Summers, people like Instagram's co-founders, Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger, people like Annabella Mejia. And in your generation, there are so many more ways to catch kindness and share kindness with each other. You know that the internet isn't a series of wires, but a series of connections, connections between people. People have access to you. Eyes are on you, which is why it's all the more essential that you answer the call of kindness. Show the world that kind people finish first. Show the world how to lift people up and not tear them down. And one day, when you're scrambling and stumbling, reap the kindness that you have sown. It will help you get up when you're knocked down and help everyone around you do the most important work of all, building companies and organizations you're proud to work for because they build the kind of world we're all proud to live in. 20 years from now, you won't remember who your commencement speaker was, but I hope you remember that she said this, hashtag be kind, the rest is commentary. Class of 2018, kindness works. Now go work at it and go blue. Marnie, I want to uh, thank you very, very much for those inspiring words. It's a reminder for me just how uh, both the small gestures and the, the large gestures that, uh, uh, that we engage in in life can have a really meaningful impact on people and uh, a reminder for all of us to, uh, to conduct ourselves with kindness. So thank you very, very much.